so today we celebrate God's mothering love for each of us. And we're going to reflect on, on how that love is expressed uh, in different ways in our care uh, for one another. Uh, special welcome to our preacher this morning, Michael Noble. And um, I had a message from Michael say he was having computer problems. So I was very pleased to see him pop up uh, as one of our participants this morning. And uh, Michael, we, we look forward to you sharing with us uh, a little later in the service. We're going to uh, have our first hymn. Uh, it's number 608 in Singing the Faith. All praise to our redeeming Lord. time of prayer now so let us pray come mother god come as enfolding nurturing presence come as steadfast love to hold us come mother god come as an enabling strengthening force Come as tough love to let us go. Come, Mother God, come as friend and comforter, healing our wounds, walking our way. Come as wounded healer to make us whole. In moments of quiet, we acknowledge that our relationships with one another have not always been life-affirming. We have not always been 
as in Charles Wesley's hymn, consented all in Jesus' name in perfect harmony. And so we are sorry for the times we have fallen short in thought, word or deed. Thank you, loving God, for all that you give to us and all that you are to us. You show patient mercy and gracious forgiveness. You give gifts for life. Help us live to the full and bring to the fore the fruits of your spirit. Thank you for Mother Church nurturing our faith, feeding us milk when tender in years of faith and solid food as we grow to committed discipleship. Thank you, loving God, drawing us to the very heart of your care, embracing us with tender strength. In Jesus' name, we thankfully pray. I invite you, if you wish, to unmute yourselves uh, and as we share in saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us and our trespasses, us. as we as forgive we those who trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. St. John's Gospel, chapter 19 verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary's, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. And reading from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with a gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. 
Uh, we're going to hear another song now. Uh, this one's not in Singing the Faith. Uh, it's a lovely song entitled Mary, Did You Know? And at the uh, heart of our service, uh, we're now going to hear three stories about mothering love uh, put into practice in, in different situations. And uh, the first one is from Rachel, who's um, recorded her story on video. So let's uh, listen to Rachel. Hello, my name's Rachel and I am a primary school teacher and Rogers asked me to talk about kindness during lockdown. So as you'll be aware, children were not able to be in school, so they were learning remotely and we were giving them lots of tasks um, to cover the curriculum, which involved them answering questions and doing different activities. But we decided as a staff, we wanted to do something that would just really enable them to relax and enjoy and really we wanted to promote self-kindness so we decided that we would read them a class novel and we took it to a vote and the children decided on this book which is called Stop the Train by Geraldine McCorkran 
and it's set in the United States of America at the time when the West was being colonized and populated. And it's a frontier town in Oklahoma on the prairie. And each day we would record a chapter and also look through the book and if there were any particular words that were challenging we would um, tell the children about the meaning of those words and sometimes we'd have a bit of fun with quizzes and have a general chat about how we were going but generally each day there would be a time when they could just sit back relax and enjoy this book and lots of the children found this a really lovely thing to do and when we got to the end of the book, I wrote to the author, Geraldine McCorkran, just to say thank you so much for the gift of this book because we have really enjoyed it and it has helped us get through the lockdown time. Um, and she replied to me and told us that she was really thankful that we had enjoyed her book. And then she wrote a very special letter to our class where she told us all about how she'd been getting on in lockdown and how she writes, as well as asking us about how we write. And we just found that this was a really special time where the kindness the teachers had showed ended up being kindness from an author. And then this week, now we're back at school, we are going to write back to her to thank her for her lovely kind letter. Okay, thank you. Bye. Uh, so that was a great uh, lockdown story from Rachel. Uh, we're going to hear uh, something very different now from Marjorie, who's here with us live or is live on Zoom anyway. Definitely alive. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for the confirmation. So um, Marjorie, tell us your story. Right. Well, Judith and I, along with the help of Pauline, Jenny, Jean and Anne, run a little group at Eden Methodist Church called Rainboat. That's not to be confused with Girl Guiding's Rainbows. Ours is a small group of boys and girls ranging in age from five to 14 years. It should really only be five to 11, but some of the older ones didn't want to leave and they've now become junior helpers. Um, we're like a family because the older ones help the younger ones and all the ladies who run the group are like mums, or in some cases, grand mums, <laughs> and even in one case, great grand mums. <laughs> um, we haven't been able to meet since March 2020, of course, but we've kept in touch with the children and their families, mainly by letter, to keep them informed of what's happening. Now, each year in our later autumn meetings, Part of each session was spent making cards and small gifts suitable to give to members of their families and their friends at Christmas. And each week, whatever had been made was put into a named bag so that the children could take it home at the end of the meeting nearest to Christmas. So last year, because we weren't meeting, towards the end of October, we trawled through the walk-in cupboard at church that's given to Rainboat um, to find items which we could put into bags and deliver to the young people with instructions for projects that they could try in the weeks leading up to Christmas. We found blank cards and envelopes, we found some lovely nativity cards produced by the leprosy mission for children to colour in, we found calendar tabs, we found pictures and stickers, we found materials to make Christmas decorations and we found small gifts. And we spent nearly a whole day with everything spread out on our large dining room table and we tried to get things that were suitable for each age group, particularly the craft items, to put into their, these bags. And when we got all the bags packed, we worked out a route and Judith and I spent one Saturday morning delivering the bags to every child in the group, along with a letter explaining how the projects could be carried out. We found that all the families were at home and although we were masked <laughs> and socially distanced, we were pleased that where children came to the door with parents, they recognised us and were obviously delighted to see us. 
greeting us with big smiles and from one young lady leaping up and down with excitement. The parents were very grateful for the things to help to keep their children occupied and many of them commented on how much the children had missed the meetings. A few weeks later we were delighted to receive a beautifully coloured in Christmas card, one of the leprosy mission ones, containing a message from Annie age seven to say thank you for the contents of the bag. The card from Annie some of you will remember her as the angel with attitude when the Rainbow children took part in the Nativity Tableau in church in December 2019. And we were really touched by her thoughtfulness because she obviously saw us as part of her family, two of her Rainbow mums. Yes, thank you, Marjorie, for, for sharing that. And, and th thank you to all the uh, rainbow team. Um, and our third story is from Tonya. Uh, she's, she's made a, an audio recording, uh, but no less powerful for that. Like many over lockdown, I have been caring for my mum since lockdown one. Um, this has been a significant moment really for me, uh, having to put my life on hold and suddenly throughout lockdown one, two and three, uh, looking after my mum since discovering she has Alzheimer's. Uh, she used to live in York and I've recently moved her to Leeds, which again, I guess was another significant move uh, or significant moment for me. Um, moving somebody from York to Leeds during a lockdown and trying to move everything for her without it being stressful for her. Um, yeah, two significant, strange moments that stand out. Um, there's been so much gone on. It's it's tough. It's been tough for everyone. Um, but this has changed my relationship with my mum. Um, since I realised she has Alzheimer's, um, I'm more patient with her. Uh, I guess I'm a little closer as she's easier, strangely, to be around. It's really hard, but she's no idea. The work involved, everything that's going on behind the scenes, spending so much time uh, looking after her. Um, as people are aware, she's like a toddler um, in a grown-up body. Um, yeah, in a nutshell, during lockdown, um, we were caring for her and driving to York and back, trying to look after her and realised it wasn't working, we needed her back in Leeds. Um, I could only do so much. We had carers coming in to help us in York, um, but thankfully we got a retirement flat became available for her, and we took her to sh have a look at it at Christmas and, and moved her in January. Um, I guess when you're thinking about caring for somebody, and it's during lockdown, um, everything becomes more, more difficult. Um, but we moved her in, we brought her to stay with us, we cared for her, fed her, did everything for a week and then in the evenings I would drive over to York and slowly pack up her flat and over the period of a week and a full weekend we packed up, we moved all her stuff and we moved it to Leeds. Then we unpacked it and then finally we moved my mum in and in answer to Roger's question, a sort of significant moment was very much so when my mum came in to the new flat and we worried she'd kick off or worry about how she'd feel. And she simply looked around and said, let's put the kettle on. That was the moment, I guess, we were dreading whether she'd settled down, whether she'd like it, what she thought. Um after the, the horrendous move but it was just sheer relief and thank god that all that hard work paid off that's care um caring it's it's helping somebody it's loving somebody um and the irony is my mum may be losing her faculties um with alzheimer's but she's perfectly happy this is something i've never known my mum be because she's always suffered with depression most of her life so I've always found her to be a very hard person to be around, but now 
strangely, I feel closer to her and I get on with her better. And now I'm caring for her full time. Um, it's a role reversal where she's the toddler and I'm looking after her and I'm no longer angry and cross with her as I used to be. Um, it's not her fault. I know that. Um, I just have to be patient. This caring journey has changed me. Uh, I'm learning to try and find a balance and spend time with the family as well, but it is hard. And I'm starting another slow grieving process, uh, and I'm already familiar with one already. Luckily, I've got my faith, my friends, a fridge full of wine and chocolate to help me through these challenges. Well, so thank you very much to the, the, the people who shared those stories. Um, it's been re really good to hear. Um, in which case, let's move on to our next hymn. Uh, it's 615 in Singing the Faith, Let Love Be Real.
So now I'm pleased to welcome Michael to share with us. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Roger. Good morning to everybody. It's good to be with you this morning. Have you noticed how lots of words have come into common speech during the COVID pandemic? Uh, we've used one several times already this morning, lockdown. Uh, how many of us used that uh, before March last year? Uh, or Zoom that we're doing this morning. How much has that become an everyday word in our language? Uh, how many of us used it very often before this year? Uh, and the word household that comes in so many sort of official pronouncements from the government in terms of what can and can't be done, because one of the challenges during the pandemic is the need to define who or what is your household. How far can your household be stretched to include people, for example, in your bubble? Uh, how many homes create a household when you've got a bubble involved? How multi-generational should it be or could it be? Uh, and indeed, how advisable is that? And uh, in two weeks or so's time, if it happens on time, of course, what other household will you want to meet up with? Outdoors, of course, in the garden or in open space. And what will that household look like? The extract from John's Gospel that we heard read this morning gives us a picture, a picture of the small group of the followers of Jesus who are gathered near the cross at his crucifixion to watch what is happening. He notices them and picks out a couple of them for special mention. He pairs up his mother, unnamed uh, at this point, and the disciple whom he loved, also unnamed. And he pairs them up as son and mother. Mother, here's your son. Son, here's your mother. And the disciple takes his mother home with him. The disciple Jesus loved is unnamed in various places in the latter part of John's Gospel. It's generally held to be John, the son of Zebedee, one of the 12 disciples, who is also generally held to be the author of the Gospel. But actually, neither of those is definitely known. And in one sense, it doesn't really matter. But at this key point in the narrative, right at the crucifixion of Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved and his mother are put together by Jesus. Mother, this is your son. Son, this is your mother. Now, elsewhere in the Gospels, we do know that Jesus had other brothers and sisters. And we might well be thinking, well, isn't it their job? to look after Jesus's mother. There's plenty of them. Surely one of them's got room to take her in. I wonder if they were all a bit put out if they got to hear this part of the story. When he's telling this other person, not part of the family, to look after their mother and take her in to the house. Which all gets me to think, is there something else going on here in the gospel behind the very obvious of Jesus wanting to pair up these two people to whom he is obviously very close? As I looked at a number of different translations for this passage this morning, they all seem to use the same sentence pretty much, and the disciple took her into his home to translate verse 27. Now, home is a translation here of the Greek word oikos. That's the original Greek word that's actually used in the original text, oikos. And actually, when you look into that word, it has more than one meaning. Oikos was the basic unit of society in Greek city-states those that were around long before the Roman Empire came and took over that part of the world. Oikos meant 
house or home, as we have it in this bit of the translation. But it also meant all the people formally forming a household or a family, including slaves. It's the same idea that actually we have in, in family, which comes from the Roman familia, which means the same thing. Everybody forming one family or household. And it also means all the descendants of one family. So oikos has a range of meanings. So we could read it here rather than the disciple took her into his home. The disciple took her into his household. That word that we're beginning to become familiar with rather more through the pandemic. Let's unpick what that may be saying to us then if we take that that slant of the word oikos that can mean both home and household and everybody in the household. If you look at Mary, she plays a significant part in John's gospel at the start as well as at the end. She's the one who at the wedding at Cana right at the start of John's gospel uh, instructs the servants to do what Jesus tells them to do. And if we look at Mary, she seems to portray some kind of symbolic mother role for the people of Israel. Perhaps she was one of the leaders of the Jewish component of the early Christian community for whom this gospel is written. And if we look at the disciple who Jesus loved, perhaps he's saying that this is the kind of discipleship that he approves of and that he wants to see in his followers. If you look at the number of references to the disciple whom he loved earlier in the gospel, you get that kind of picture that this is somebody who is following in the way that Jesus wants the person to follow. So maybe in pairing up, at least figuratively, if not literally, the disciple and his mother, Jesus is, in fact, creating a new family, a new household of believers. The disciple Jesus loved and Mary are commended to each other as part of this same household, perhaps rather than home. To demonstrate that what Jesus is creating in his family of disciples is a new household. It has a new nature as a family and a place of discipleship. And in that context, the actual family relationship of the other brothers and sisters of Jesus is not relevant. We get a hint of that if we look in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 49 and 50, where his mother and his brothers and sisters come to speak to Jesus but he ignores them and points to his disciples and says that whoever does the will of his heavenly father is his brother and sister. This is a new household, a new household of disciples, a new home, if you like, a new family, to use all three versions of the translation of oikos. It becomes a foundational principle, the basis on which the community of Christians that John is writing to is founded. And as his mother and the disciple are paired up to look after each other, he shows, Jesus shows that this community, this household, this new family is a place for mutual care and support. And if we look at the Colossians reading, uh, one of my favourites, not least because we had it at our wedding and maybe a number of you also might have had it at yours. Paul is showing what some of the marks of this new household ought to be, this family, the things that hold it together. The things that differentiate this kind of family, this kind of household from any other. The things that show how this household, this family, should conduct themselves and how they should live. 
And today we might want to say that perhaps it is a good definition of mothering caring, perhaps. One which reflects the love of God, which binds everything together, to use Paul's phrase. So to come back to our initial thought about households today and the oft use of that word. What does this reading say to us today of what our Christian household actually looks like? Who is in our household, our home, our family? How far can it be stretched to include other people in our bubble? What might it look like? Is it whoever does the will of the heavenly one? To quote Jesus from Matthew's gospel, whoever does the will of my heavenly father is my father's brother or sister. Is it whoever shows mothering caring is part of this household, reflecting the love of God? And the reading asks us to reflect, do we take our place, each of us, in God's household? And if so, do we show those things that Paul is listing? Compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, Christ's peace, thankfulness, the love which binds everything together, doing everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. The graces, we might say, that define mothering caring and which reflect the love of God shown to us and for us to demonstrate to others. Is our household, our Christian family, where we fit in at the moment, whichever of your churches you might fit in or mine, are they places of continuing discipleship, the kind that Jesus commends? And it is our household, our Christian household, marked by this mothering caring. Is it a sense of home where everyone can feel part of family? just as we've been hearing in some of the stories that have been shared this morning. And perhaps finally, how can each of us in our own way and in our local church communities be more effective in our communities as distinctive voices for this kind of new household? Does it affect our understanding of ourselves as a missional community, seeking to show that love of God which binds everything together in mutual care, love and support? Are we perhaps to be an open household, an open house, an open home, where all can feel and can share the caring love of God. Amen. I invite you to join with me now in a time of prayer for ourselves and then for others. And hopefully Andrew is going to share on screen uh, a response to the prayer time. So as I say the words, Lord, let your light shine, I invite you to join in saying, in our hearts and in your world. So let us pray. Lord, we seek to make our home in you. For in you is our hope. In you is our peace. May we abide in you as you are in us. Grant that in turning to you, we may find new vision, new strength and new love. 
Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Lord, we pray that your church may be a home, a home for the weary, a shelter for the fearful, a strength to the weak, a place of healing and forgiveness to the troubled and the guilty. And we pray for all who are spiritually hungry, for all who have lost faith or who have lost hope. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Lord of life, we pray for the starving peoples, for those without adequate food or shelter, who do not have a home to call their own. We pray for street children and those who have no one to care for them. We pray for refugees and those who are working to support them. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. We come to you, Lord of love. We give you thanks for our homes and loved ones. May we not take their love for granted. May we not be a burden to those with whom we live. In loving each other, may we learn of your love for us. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Loving Lord, we pray for families where there is misunderstanding neglect, violence or apathy. We pray for homes of poverty and fear. We pray for those who find this particular day difficult. We remember all who have lost loved ones this week all who are caring for loved ones who are ill, those parted from loved ones due to sickness, because of restrictions. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Lord, in love, you welcome us home. You come to meet us and lead us to your kingdom. We pray for all who have the joy of your nearer presence, for our own loved ones departed. Lord, let your light shine in our hearts and in your world. Lord, so may we walk as children of the light, children of the day, in all goodness and righteousness. May your love enfold us. May it uphold us and guide us as we make our prayer in the name of Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Michael.
uh, thank you to everybody who shared in the service today. Uh, special thanks to Andrew for um, the IT challenge of bringing all the different formats together. Uh, but it's been great to hear the different voices. Uh, we're going to have our final song now, uh, 594 in Singing the Faith, Lord Jesus Christ. we come to the uh, close of our service uh, I invite you to unmute mute yourselves uh, and let's bless one another uh, each of us you know with our own unique stories um, let's share together may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore Amen. Amen.